Can you guys hear with the microphone? Is it loud enough where you're all sitting? Okay, good, because I can't really tell from the echoes over here, besides I'm very old. Um, my talk today is actually going to be in two pieces. We're going to spend about three quarters of our time in New Orleans looking at things that we learned from New Orleans, but that have direct ramifications for California and our own levy issues. Then at the very end, we're going to come back for the last quarter and look directly at California and some of its principal levy problems. Just to give you the idea, this is not sort of an abstract exercise. A lot of the nation has missed the point this past year. The New Orleans investigations were not about southern Louisiana. The entire nation has a 40-year deficit in terms of spending and refurbishing and so on levies, and we have massive levy risk in lots of areas. And it's an, it's an uh, almost insurmountable hurdle at this point in terms of a mountain to climb. California's taking a very avant-garde role there, but we're getting not a lot of federal help. And so you guys become important twice, both in terms of enlightening your colleagues and friends, but also in terms of the politics of the situation. But we will start in New Orleans. And to start in New Orleans, I want to begin by pointing out, although I can't advance, I guess I'll stand over here, by pointing out that New Orleans, we're frozen. There we go. I can advance with the other button, this will work. Okay, by pointing out that New Orleans is officially now the most costly failure of an engineered system in the history of the world. The estimated losses are on the order of about 150 to 300 billion dollars. Almost 1,500 people died. 400,000 people were initially displaced from their home, and more than half of them remained displaced. And 85% of a major American city was essentially destroyed. The other thing I have to point out is that what I'm going to say next isn't my own work. It's the work of a very large team. Um, as was pointed out, it was the NSF-sponsored national investigation team. This was a group in the end of 39 leading national and international experts people all much smarter than myself, who between them had amazing conjugate experience. Um, parts of the list, these guys had, had studied 14 major earthquakes, domestic and abroad. They had studied 12 hurricanes, two tsunamis, um, space sh shuttle disasters, Challenger, and uh, Columbia, the Exxon Valdez oil spill, numerous offshore platform collapses. I think it was 17 dam failures. Basically carnage, death, and destruction all over the world. And they were a very outstanding group of people and a real experience to work with. Um, they also, I have to point out parenthetically, were the best of everything about what we do. They all worked for free. We could never have afforded to hire these guys, but when we offered them the chance to work pro bono, they all jumped on it. So these guys dug in hard, risking their own careers uphill against the federal pressures, which were enormous at some times, to do the right thing because it was necessary and because somebody had to do it. Okay, New Orleans was worse than you think. Um, Everybody knows that it was bad, but it was actually, when you go and see it, it was worse than you think. The scope of the devastation was just amazing. I've been to three, hurricane, three earthquakes where over 15 to 20,000 people died each, and so I've seen lots of dead bodies, and I know that smell very intimately. But we had never seen anything in terms of the pervasiveness of destruction in New Orleans. In a big earthquake, you have pockets of damage, and in between the pockets of damage, you have pockets that aren't damaged. In New Orleans, there were no pockets that weren't damaged. Hundreds of city blocks were flooded all at once, just like this. You can take this photograph and extend it, and extend it again, and extend it again, and you can drive for 15, 20 minutes across parts of town. And it just stayed like this the whole time. These are all flooded to their roofs and eaves, and some of them beyond that. And if you zoom in on a photograph like this, what you find is individual catastrophes, one household at a time. These people have lost everything. They've lost the home that they spent their whole life buying, purchasing, and furnishing. They've lost their community and their neighbors, so they have nobody to help them begin rebuilding. They've lost their church and their community, which is very important in New Orleans, and they've lost their jobs because their businesses have been flooded out as well. In fact, if they want to go back in and camp and begin tearing their house apart down to the bare timbers, treating it for fungus and rot and rebuilding it, they haven't even got stores to shop at because the stores were also destroyed. It's a very tough business. There's a scope of devastation here which transcends the American experience in modern times. And if you drove across town, you've had a sort of a new sense of topography. It was a really odd and eerie experience. As you drive across any town, even Berkeley, you know you're coming up the hill and you're going down the hill, but you're not aware so much of how the hill goes up and down a bit as you travel. In New Orleans you are, because in New Orleans, as you travel, there's this terrible line that just runs straight across each neighborhood. And that's the bathtub ring. Everything below there has had the paint stripped off and damaged by the salt water. The trees and the vegetation are all dead below there, but they're often bright and green and happy above. 
and that's been salt water mixed with toxic solvents and things from people's bathrooms and garages. And it's a very eerie experience. It makes topography very readily apparent in the city of New Orleans. The other thing you do as you drive across town is you inadvertently watch the big red X's. And what you look for is a little O. The little O means nobody died in this one. And of course, it wasn't always that way with all the X's. Okay, we're going to tell the story of the New Orleans hurricane in four pieces. It's almost a disaster in four acts. And we're going to begin from the southern end, and then the east, and then the middle, and then come around from the north, because that's how the hurricane attacked New Orleans. Katrina crossed the Florida panhandle, came across the Gulf. She was about a one and a two across Florida. Became about a five at this location here after drawing energy off the warm Gulf waters. She downgraded to a four as she began to have her first edge lean and have some friction against the coast. And she came on shore at roughly a good mid-sized strong category three hurricane. That was just about what the system had been designed to safely accommodate. And it should have been okay. Turns out it wasn't. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I think lights off is a very good idea. Oops, if I can do it. I don't think I have the switch. There we go. Does that work for you guys? Uh, one, one came on. Can you put the last one on? Does that work for you guys? If that works for you guys, that works good for me. I can see you guys squinting, but I can't tell from the side how much you can see because all I get is like a silhouette. I have to guess what the slides are. <laughs> okay, now well, let's go back to previous. Okay, the first act was the approach from the south. As Katrina came up onto the Gulf Coast, there was a massive storm surge. The storm surge rose up in this area by about 20 to 22 feet. All the light spots here are part of the Gulf of Mexico at mean sea level. All the yellow spots are tidal marshes, which are underwater only at very high tides. This whole area was not just underwater high tide. The water came up and just completely swamped the area. This became part of the Gulf of Mexico. And in the process, it swamped what's called Plaquemines Parish. New Orleans is up here. This is the main downtown city part. This is the eastern lobe of New Orleans East. This is St. Bernard Parish over here. And this is the lower end of the Mississippi River, which travels down and enters the Gulf at this location down here. Along both sides of the Mississippi is a narrow strip less than a mile wide called Plaquemines Parish, which is the local word for a county. It's owned by one family, and there were 18,000 people living there. Happily, all but 60 of them got out. Unhappily, those 60 all died because Plaquemines Parish became part of the Gulf of Mexico. The storm just massively and brutally overtopped all the levees on both sides. You can see erosion damage periodically along this one as the waves chewed back and forth and simply eroded it. But what it did to the people and the communities of Plaquemines Parish was pretty much pick them up, toss them sideways, and deposit them more or less as matchsticks on the crest of the levees on the riverside. And so this is part of the remains of Plaquemines Parish scattered along what is the main Mississippi River levee down at the bottom there. We're going to draw lessons throughout here that have analogies for California. So all the phrases that are highlighted in red are going to come home again over the next decade as we work on levees here in California, but we'll start with this one. And the lessons here are simple. They begin with hubris and denial. There was no good reason to have humans living in Plaquemines Parish. It stuck out like a boxer's chin or a boxer's nose, and it was going to get broken. Everybody living there knew it, and so did the family that owned it. And yet there were 18,000 people there and their homes, possessions, and businesses. That was silly. The other lesson is that we have to learn to make hard decisions. We have to defend what we can, but we have to also walk away from those things that we either can't defend or that aren't economically reasonable to defend. It would be a misallocation of resources to defend some things. Plaquemines Parish, as a county, has requested $3 billion from the federal government to refurbish their levees to do better next time. But less than 7,000 people are expected to move back in. If you divide $3, $3 billion by 7,000, you get an enormous gift of more than a quarter million dollars to each man, woman, and child in Plaquemines Parish, and it just doesn't make any sense for our nation to invest that kind of money. Blackman Parish's real use is it serves as a utility corridor servicing the offshore oil industry, which is, of course, very important for a while until we use up the last of the oil. But the pipes for that can be undergrounded, the roads can run on the levee crest, and they can be repaired if they get some damage from scour, and the whole thing can be made submergible. Every three or four decades, when the big hurricane blows through, it can go underwater and pop back up and continue to function, and the cost of that would not be several billion dollars. So we have to pick and juice. Okay, after the hurricane took out Plaquemines Parish, which is the section down here, 
It then passed the eye of the storm to the right of the city of New Orleans. As it did, it went over the top of this little light blue patch here. All the light blue stuff is part of the Gulf of Mexico. All the dark blue is landlocked lakes. This is called Lake Bourne, but it's not a lake. It's actually a bay. It's connected to the Gulf of Mexico. And so the storm surge coming onto the coast raised up Lake Bourne and swelled it outside its normal boundaries. And then the swirling winds, which were moving counterclockwise, threw Lake Bourne over the right flank of the storm protection system. And this is that critical moment when that occurred. These are the swirling winds, and this is therefore the eye of the hurricane right here. This is the storm surge color-coded by the increase in water depth. And Lake Bourne had been around about this area here. Now it fills the entire area through here and has become contiguous with Lake Pontchartrain to the north. But at this location here, all that high water is being pushed into a funnel and it's overtopping this levee for St. Bernard Parish and this levee for New Orleans East. Two communities of roughly 100,000 each. And the results were absolutely devastating. What happened was the hurricane threw the water over, but also, and equally importantly, threw these two massive levee frontages. And this was the first true great disaster. We're going to look at several shots along this frontage, and then one here, and one here, and one here, and a few slides after. But we're going to start along this frontage. These frontages here were built of highly erodible materials, materials that had been dredged out of the light blue channels along here, which are navigation, navigable channels for ships. And that was an inexpensive way of getting levee fill. That was a way of saving some money. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The results were devastating. This is one of those levees along the St. Bernard Parish. Actually, it's not one of the levees. It looks kind of like the aluminum siding along your garden that separates your lawn from your flower bed. But what you're looking at is 17 feet exposed of PZ-29 sheet piles, about the largest section made. And these are two and a half foot diameter pipes. And they had been sitting on the levee crest, so they served very nicely to frame the levee for you. And that had been the levee at this location. The levee is simply gone. It vaporized. It washed away. It eroded catastrophically. A mile further north, there was no need for sheet piles because that levee section was performing more properly as it had been designed. And it's gone too. If you look very carefully in your geotechnical, what you'll notice is a slight indentation where the levee had pressed down the swamp deposits and consolidated them before it was vaporized by massive erosion. And this is a third view along that same frontage. This is looking inboard to the swamps behind the levees. And what you have here is the detritus from the eroded levee section. And this is a photograph that makes me both angry and sad at the same time, much like last night sitting in a hotel room in Kansas City watching the World Trade Towers collapse over and over again on all the different newscasts. Because what you're seeing here is shells. The levee fill along this section of the frontage was lightweight shell sand material, known to be massively and catastrophically erodible, and in my view, a material that has no place in levees protecting large urban populations. It was available, it was dredged from the adjacent channel, and so it was used. There was no cutoff at this section, and there was no armoring or outboard face protection. These are erosion tests from part of our study. We took samples of soils from levees all throughout the system. And what you have on the vertical axis here is the rate at which soil erodes, how fast they get scraped off by the water rushing over the tops of the levees. And over here is the velocity of the flow. As the water comes over the top of the levee and scoots down the backside, it tends to carve the soil off. And the faster it flows, the more it erodes. And you can break the soils up into highly erodible, down through soils that have a very high resistance to erosion. The materials along this frontage are the red, sorry, are, are the brown, black, and dark green symbols up over here. And they are catastrophically erodible. In other sections of the system, there were in-between materials. And we'll look at one of those in the section. But there were also a lot of levees that were built over here of properly handled and well-compacted, cohesive, clayey soils. Dealing with those soils, drying them out enough, placing them and spreading them, and then picking them up again, putting them on levees and compacting them in layers, takes longer, it's more work, and it's more expensive. But the incremental cost gives you a levee which is intrinsically highly erodible to resistance and which can be overtopped safely for a while, as we'll see. This is a section of in-between materials, and you can see, if you look very carefully, that you have striated layers, but it's basically a clayey sand material. It's got some cohesion, but not enough to do really well. The water came over the levee and ran down the backside. The velocity increases, so the erosion begins low on the backside. In this location here, it's almost pushed its way through the crest, but not quite. This is about a mile to the south of the photographs we were looking at a few minutes ago of the catastrophically eroded sections built of poor sandy and shell sand materials. About a mile and a half to the north of those sections is this levee. 
This levee was massively overtopped for about two to two and a half hours. After the storm, as you can see, the maintenance crew needs to mow the lawns. This levee is undamaged. This is a material that was brought in from a slight distance. It was borrowed from another area. It was dried out, spread, and compacted very nicely. It had a high intrinsic resistance, and it was essentially undamaged along 11 miles after significant overtopping for a sustained, sustained period of about two to two and a half hours. And that's how it can be. But it wasn't how it was along those two critical frontages here and here, and the results were catastrophic. We'll look at this one in particular. Behind this frontage section, which was expected to fight the storm for a while and perhaps then fail, was a large open area of swamps and cypress groves, which had been left open essentially as a catch basin. And then there was a, a secondary levee along here of lesser height, which was supposed to catch the water that came trickling across and protect the pink zone, which is where all the people live. Those are the populous regions didn't work that way. These levees died so fast and so catastrophically along almost 11 contiguous miles that the storm surge came through here while it was still rising. And the still rising surge jumped over that second levee like a speed bump. People who had stayed in town instead of evacuating, especially on the high ground down near the river here, described a tidal wave coming towards them, a wall of water. And that storm surge pushed the water in and they didn't just simply flood the sea level as did most of this area over here. They flooded to an elevation of plus 12 feet above sea level. So people who lived on the high ground over here and thought they were safe were instead flooded. People who lived on the low ground over here were flooded to very great depths, and about 500 people died in these neighborhoods. And this is what it looked like when that wall of water came through. Homes were picked off and thrown across their foundations. Cars were spun by toys. One car was left up on a roof. 107-foot tuna boat was deposited right in the middle of a uh, neighborhood. Um, it's not obvious where this house came from, and we thought it was coming from here, but actually this house came from about a block and a half up this way. It traveled a fair distance before it came to the rest of that location. Um, it's not obvious who owns what, but it's not obvious that much is worth owning because, of course, all these buildings are suffering massively from dry rot and fungus at this, at this time, and they're all going to have to be destroyed and rebuilt from scratch. And the lessons here are simple. The first is, do it right or don't do it at all. One of the pervasive themes throughout this event was political pressure and even congressional appropriations which required doing things economically, which means saving a little bit of money at the front end during construction, but in the process, increasing the risk that it wasn't going to work. Over and over again, we saw safety traded off against short-term economics. Along these two particular frontages, they saved maybe $30 million dollars by using locally dredged materials instead of importing and working harder to process clays in the wet weather. The losses in these neighborhoods were on the order of 50 to 100 billion dollars. More than a thousand times the amount of money they saved. And that's a lesson for all of us as we look at our own levy risk in California. If we're going to do levies, let's either do them right or let's abandon properties and pull back. Second issue is ductility and resilience. These sections failed, and they failed catastrophically. There was no backup position. But we can build these levees so that if they do overtop, they overtop safely. And even if they don't overtop fully safely, they fail slowly and in a controlled way, and they continue to resist the principal forces of the storm until the surge subsides. Hurricane storm surges come and go over the period of less than a day, but the peak of the surge comes and goes over about five or six hours. And if these things will even give us five or six hours of protection, they can massively reduce the damages and probably eliminate risk to life. And so we can do a better job of being ductile and resilient, even in the face of storms that are bigger than we're designed to handle. Okay, after the storm went over these flanks down over here, that same surge from Lake Bourne pushed down the central artery through here, which is the Gulf Intercoastal Waterway, overtopping levees on both sides and causing some small failures, and it ponded up to a very high level in the industrial canal, also called the Inner Harbor Navigation Channel, causing about 17 failures around this perimeter. Most of those failures were relatively small, but two of them were massive and catastrophic. There were in this event eight main failures, and those eight failures between them probably contributed about 80% of the damage and maybe 90% of the loss of life. And so we're going to look at these two next, especially this one, which is the bigger of the two. This is the famous breach at the west end of the Lower Ninth Ward. A lot of people died in this area. This is that breach seen from the air. At the time of this photograph, the emergency repair embankment has just been completed on the outboard side. And the breach from the levee along here starts here. And this is all open until the levee and wall are intact again here. 
what you can see is laid along the ground, the sheet pile curtain, which goes to the heart of the levee and supports the concrete wall. And over here, you can see a bit of concrete on top, but it's mostly spalled off along here. This sheet pile curtain has been stretched out about 30% longer than its original length. Most of the flanges have been flattened, but the sheet piles have not let go. They have held their interlock. So if I'm the guy that made these sheet piles, this is the cover of my brochure for the rest of my life, because these sheet piles more than did their job. What didn't do its job was the levee in which they were embedded. There's also, if you'll notice, a large barge right here. And it might strike you as odd because, of course, the barge doesn't belong here. It belongs on this side in the water. And that raises the first question, which came first, the chicken or the egg? And the answer is as follows. This is a close-up view of the barge from the other end. There's a small school bus here. The barge did not come through the hole, dance around, and then land on a school bus. What actually happened was the barge originally landed about 150 feet further back over here. And then about three and a half weeks after Katrina, a second hurricane came through, a second surge rose up, and the interim repair section burst a second time and reflooded this neighborhood. The barge picked itself up, sailed forward, and came to rest right here. In that intervening period of several weeks, 400 and some school buses were stolen from the city of New Orleans because they were all sitting downtown with full gas tanks and they would have been able to take people safely out, but there were no drivers because they'd already taken off with their families. And so people hotwired them and then they abandoned them when they ran out of gas. So the school bus arrived between the two hurricanes and the barge came and sat on the nose of the school bus. On this side of the barge is a huge dent and along the bottom is one big scrape. And that dent and scrape coincide with the one location where the barge hit the wall. And that was right here, the extreme southern end of the feature. The barge came scraping along here and it hit. And this is the only section where the concrete is crushed in compression and the rebar is all gnarled. Everywhere else it's pulled apart in extension as the sheet pile curtains simply extended themselves. And so the barge hit the southern end of a 750 foot wide breach that was well developed and simply sucked it in. And so the barge did not cause the breach. I say that with some emphasis because there is one attorney in New Orleans who hates every time I say that because he's suing the barge. He's not going to win. What then did cause the failure? Well, there are two models. One thing that happened was the water came over the top of this wall by about a foot and a half, and as it cascaded down the backside of the eye wall, it eroded a trench behind it, which provided a relief and therefore a lateral unbracing of the wall. And since the water pressures on the left side, the other side were pushing hard, the unbracing might have been enough to push the wall over. There were, in fact, four eye wall sections at other locations in New Orleans that failed exactly as a result of that mechanism. But our investigation team concluded that was not what happened at this site. The official federal investigation did conclude that was the failure source of this site, and that ends up being important in terms of mitigation and moving forward for repair of the system for the future. What we think happened at this site is as follows. I think the site's frozen. Well, I may not have any ideas in this site. The button that was working has ceased to function. That's as much pressure as we can apply without breaking the laptop. Anybody have any suggestions? We need technical assistance. Yeah. Seems like it's locked up. Is there a 15-year-old in the audience? <laughs> there you go. That's the next one. Okay, we're back on. Perhaps it was just thinking very hard. Okay. This is a cross-section of that location. figure out how to go back. Well, the back arrow doesn't work, we try that. We can go back this way. No, we're going forward again. Well, 
We have to painfully go back and slide at times we get there. Give us a second and we'll be in. One more. Oh, it won't form the picture. That's why it's having trouble. This is a very old, slow laptop and it won't like to form the picture. Well, what the previous cross-section would have showed you, and will in a minute if we wait for it, is a lovely rendition by one of our graduate students here at Berkeley. It's a shame not to see the picture, but what it shows you is the sheet pile curtain is not sufficiently deep. The sheet piles of this site were only 20 feet long, which was expedient in terms of cost, but it didn't cut off a layer of marsh deposits right here, which were between some soft gray clays and a deep deposit of soft clays down here. Had those gone about nine feet further down into the lower clays, it would have been a suitable cutoff of under seepage forces. Instead, a river of under seepage came hauling through here like a giant highway, and with them came high pore pressures. Those high pore pressures weakened the soil at this location. And with this soil zone here weakened, the forces from the water on the back side of the wall pushed the inboard half of the embankment, and it failed along a failure surface like this, translating sideways, unbracing the sheet piles and leaving them twisting in the turning waters. That's a very classic mode of failure, and Four of the eight major failures in New Orleans. Here's a cross section. You can see, if you're a geotechnical engineer, this is very frustrating because anybody can see that it would have been nice to take these sheet piles down this far. These are 20 feet long. These would have been 29 feet down to here. Okay, I'll, I'll take that. 29 <laughs> feet down to here. It's interesting to note that the repair section sheet piles at this location are 65 feet long. And that's nice, but it's too long. If you're going to fix it, you might as well fix it right. But that was way too long. Let's see again. This is our calculation of the evolution of the factor of safety at this site. As the water levels rose within the outboard side canal, the factor of safety went down. When it reaches 1.0, the section will fail. And what happened was at about an elevation of 13 feet, that gap opened on the outboard side. Water went into the gap and pushed harder. And the failure mode transitioned from this to the red line, and it failed at about 13 and a half or 14 feet, which correlates very nicely with the observed water levels in the adjacent canal sections. So this is tractable to analysis, and it's the kind of thing you could have figured out if you had done the analyses. But local policy was to largely downplay the risk of under seepage. And that'll be important in our story for California levees because it's been a fight for about 10 years up in Sacramento where the riverfront levees are on sand foundations and the sheet piles aren't nearly long enough. We're now planning a six or seven year program to lengthen and provide better cutoff up there to raise those levees to a 200 year level of protection. But lengthening sheet piles is very expensive because it involves new sheet piles or else deep soil mixing and other techniques. This is a section along that frontage. I remind you that there were four sections that did fail from overtopping and scouring of a trench. So it was important to put in the splash pads that have been added here. The reason they weren't present in the first place is because they were illegal. And this is an example of the kinds of silly rules that the Corps of Engineers and other federal agencies have to work under in order to try and keep people safe. They were illegal because Congress had authorized levee protection to the elevation of the top of the wall. And that made it illegal to think about what would happen if the water went six inches or a foot higher than that. And therefore putting splash pads in was by law an illegal waste of taxpayer dollars. The incremental cost of splash pads on the overall project would have been on the order of 2% and it would have prevented four major failures at other locations. Unfortunately, it would not have prevented the failure at this site. It was noted by somebody who just finished putting splash pads in, showing them to the press, that King Kong himself couldn't come over the top of this wall next time, and we agree with that, or if he does come over the top, it won't matter so much. Unfortunately, Katrina didn't come over the top of this wall. She went under it, and that was how this site failed, and nothing has yet been done at this site to prevent that kind of failure. There are short sheet piles throughout the entire New Orleans system. And the funding recently appropriated by Congress to refurbish and upgrade the New Orleans system is probably not going to cover the bill because they haven't yet figured in the cost of lengthening the sheet pile curtains throughout the system. Just north of that was a second big site. And we're not going to do cross sections analysis, but this is the second breach. The repair section is about two thirds complete out here. This is the breach. It's a very narrow feature. The other one was 750 feet long. This one's only about 85 feet wide, but it's a long tunnel like feature. And the analysis shows that at this site, it was again under seepage flowing under because of the insufficient cutoff. But what happened here is the water came seeping under and it began to bubble up over here and eroded and it eroded a tunnel that went back under the levee and the levee fell into it. And you can see the tunnel-like shape 
of the failure feature, which is characteristic of what we call piping or tunnel erosion failures. Lessons of these two sections are as follows. The first is consider all potential failure modes. It was expedient and cost effective to downplay under seepage as a risk to the system, but it wasn't safe. Under seepage, point number two, is the most common cause of levee failures throughout the world. And it was a problem. It was the cause of at least four of the eight biggest breaches in New Orleans. Third lesson here is pay attention to field information and observations. There was a long history of under seepage problems along this frontage after the levees and sheet piles had been installed. People had problems with water, Subsequent pumps and drains had been installed. Contractors working at the location of the second breach had trouble dewatering small excavations for secondary purposes. And finally, in the end, expert reviewers had questioned these designs along this frontage, and they too had been sort of blown off. There was lots of warnings here. Okay, next thing I want to look at is those other theme failures along this Inner Harbor Canal section. And they all share the same characteristic. They all occurred at transitions junctions and penetrations, places where lots of pieces came together. And so this is a classic one. What you have over here is a 14 foot high earth levee, full height. Over here you have a 10 foot high earth levee with a six foot high concrete flood wall on top of it supported by sheet piles. This section is several miles long and this section is several miles long. They were built at separate points in time as two separate projects because that's how appropriations came in. There was a 52-year construction window for the construction of the improved New Orleans system in the wake of 1965 Hurricane Betsy, which flooded the city. And it was broken up into small separate projects. This project here, several miles long, worked like a charm. This project here, also several miles long, worked like a charm. We haven't been able to determine, even at this point in time, who was in charge of the connection. But the connection detail was insufficient. It was a simple naked sheet pile curtain it was about a foot and a quarter less high than the walls on either side, and so it preferentially overtopped more severely. Scour came down behind and braced the wall, which then blew through and flooded the community behind it. There were 15 along this section, but overall there were more than two dozen failures at connections or junctures throughout the system. We'll look at the second one along the section. This is a penetration. The federal levee here runs from right to left, and you're looking out over the top of the levee towards the canal. Three things go through the levee here. There's the highway for the I-10 bridge, there's the CSX rail crossing with its own drawbridge, and there's a road from the port that goes over the levee crest and goes down to the outboard side to service port facilities when there isn't a hurricane. All three of these bring in three agencies with three different sets of jurisdictions, all of them overlapping the federal jurisdiction for the perimeter levee system. We have not been able to determine yet, nor have any of the other investigation teams, including that of the Corps of Engineers, who was in charge at this site. As best we can determine, nobody was in charge, and that's a severe problem. It's also daunting to know that this CSX rail crossing on the west side of the Inner Harbor Canal failed in 1965, so this is a re-failure of the same section, which is a daunting lack of progress over a 40-year period. Finally, the failure itself was a combined act. The water came through the ballast fill under the railroad lines here. It looks like it's all the same level, but the gravel is pervious, it flowed heavily through there, undermined the insufficient fill under the roadway, which hadn't been monitored by the same people that built the rest of the levee, and eroded the roadway and caused a breach, which is now in the process of being repaired. This is a composite compound failure of overlapping jurisdictions, more than engineering lapses, and it's a pervasive problem to the system. So looking at junctures and penetrations, lessons are as follows. The first is, Flood protection systems are a system. They are not graded on a curve like we do in classes. If you get 99% of the system right and those little connection details aren't, you don't have a levy. You have nothing. There's no half credit. The various elements and sections must work together well. Second is pay special attention to transitions and joints and junctures. Those are the tough spots. Doesn't count if you get seven miles of levy right. If it doesn't join at each end of something properly, you've accomplished very little. And the third is somebody has to be in charge. We're lobbying for that to be the Corps of Engineers. There's sufficient local dysfunction with oversight agencies and outsourced engineering in New Orleans. The Corps of Engineers needs to rise up and take charge of these connections and have the sufficient authority to get the work done properly and well. And finally, in the end, there's one last lesson, which is a nasty one, and it's going to come up again in a second, and that is that community safety has to be put above special interests. CSX rail crossing failed in 65. 
and it failed again in 2005. But just off to the left of this photograph is a concrete gate structure with a rolling steel gate, which was supposed to close off the rest of the system. The steel gate was removed four months prior to Katrina because a train accident hit the gate and damaged it. They took the gate off, took it away to repair it, and it was gone for four months. When Katrina came by, they erected a small sandbag weir across that opening, and the sandbags blew out at some point during the storm. Imagine putting the main section of downtown New Orleans, which is what you see if you turn and face the other directions in this photograph, a region with over 300,000 people living in it, at risk, just so you could operate a train for a few months. And think how fast that gate would have been repaired if they were instead required to weld it in place until they fabricated and brought a replacement to the site. There's some significant issues here with regard to community versus local interests. Okay, now we're going to go down to the final big piece of things. This is the main section of New Orleans. We just went over on the IHNC over here. We looked at New Orleans East and St. Bernard. The final act was that the swirling winds, swirling counterclockwise through Lake Pontchartrain south against the north end of New Orleans. And as it did, it filled up to high elevations three drainage canals, the 17th Street Canal, the Orleans Canal, and the London Avenue Canal. These canals all have big pump houses at their south ends, and rainfall from New Orleans is pumped out into Lake Pontchartrain. Rainfall is a pervasive problem. Every drop of water that lands in New Orleans has to be pumped out because it's below sea level and it won't fall out on its own. Besides, there's constantly underseepage coming in from the river and slowly percolating into the city. So they get flooding every time they have a big rainfall. It's an issue for them. The three biggest, most catastrophic failures are the three blue stars in this figure. The biggest of them was the 17th Street Canal breach. The breaches over here along this bank of the IHNC didn't erode down to below sea level. So they let water in for a few hours when the water was up, and as the storm surge subsided, they stopped flowing. So only about 10% of the water that eventually came in, filled a small area about in here, came through these breaches, and then it stopped. But these three breaches were the last to occur, and they flowed for about three and a half to four days, finally equilibrating on Thursday after the Monday morning hurricane, at an elevation of about plus two above sea level because Lake Pontchartrain was still swollen up about two feet and still draining back out slowly into the Gulf at that point in time. So these three breaches here caused between them more than half the damage and about 60% of the overall loss of life. These are the big ones. We're not going to look very long at these over here. In fact, we're going to kind of wave our hands at them because they're going to be repeat failures. This one was under seepage induced instability like we looked at at the big one at the, at the west end of the ninth ward. And this one was an under seepage induced piping erosion failure like the other big breach at the ninth ward. So I'll just tell you what those were. We're going to look at this one in some significant detail and talk about that one briefly, but I want to begin with the one that didn't happen. The middle canal didn't fail. And you might ask yourself why it didn't fail. And the answer is because it didn't need to. And there was a hole in it before the hurricane arrived. At the very south end of this canal on the east bank, the last 200 feet was left open. And this is that section. You can see the flood wall on top of the levee on the far bank over here on the west side. You can see the flood wall here, which runs almost five miles up to the north end of the, of the bank and over there. And the last 200 feet from here to just left of this photo was left open and unfinished for a decade and a half. You might ask why somebody would do that. And the answer there is very instructive. The answer has to do with the fact that in New Orleans, unlike most places, you haven't got a reclamation district which is in charge of levees, protection, and pumping. You have two separate agencies. There's the levee board and there's the water and sewerage board. The water and sewerage board's job is to pump all the water out of New Orleans, whether it comes from hurricanes or as happens every year multiple times, from rainfall from storms. And that's their principal concern, rainfall and storms. The levee board, on the other hand, only has to protect against river floods and hurricanes. Because they're separate entities, and because we're talking about New Orleans and southern Louisiana, anytime you have two different agencies, they immediately begin to fight. You chuckle, but that's how it is. They also have their own separate interests. They own shares in casinos, and they have other ways of raising funding, and they have turf issues. They issue contracts. They have a lot of power and authority. They handle a lot of money. And it becomes a big deal, but the fighting becomes personal because that's how New Orleans politics are. And so what happens is you end up with the director of the Water and Sewerage Board with a very strong personal animosity, which is equally shared by his counterpart, the director of the levy board. And these two gentlemen couldn't resolve their interests, their, sorry, their differences. 
At the very south end of the canal, just to the left of this photograph, is an ancient brick building built in 1904, which houses three magnificent, huge Woods pumps. Woods was a young man, he was 23 at the time, designed modern pumps that were the marvel of the world at that time. Without use of computers, he could just visualize cavitation and flow vectors and so on. He made these amazing pumps, which made modern New Orleans possible. And they were put in this ancient brick building, which comes across the base of the canal like a T and closes the bottom end of the canal. When the canal water rises two or three feet, the water flows through the brick wall. It's painfully obvious that it rises a couple of more feet, basically anything above about the lip right here, it would knock that wall in, collapse the entire building, and destroy the pumps. At which point, the levee board would have been responsible for the destruction of the water and sewerage board's facility. Imagine how that would sell. You think they might sue them? The solution here is obvious. One of two things had to happen. Either the levee board had to build a protective wall across and protect the front of those bastards' pump house. Or the water and sewage board had to build their own wall and in the process help those bastards finish their levee system. And for 17 years, nobody blinked. And when Hurricane Katrina arrived, there was a hole in the system at the location closest to the center of downtown New Orleans, equivalent to a hole in the bottom of a boat, right dead center. And these guys hadn't been able to get past their own personal differences in the interest of public good. So the lessons here are clear. Public safety must come first. There can be no overriding issue greater than that. And that would seem simple and obvious. But in a few minutes, we're going to be talking about the Sacramento Delta. <laughs> you guys have heard of this, I can tell. Where there are, by my count, no less than 17 important interest groups, each of which tend to have something that is their first interest, and then the second and third on their list is levy fragility. And every year they have so much money and so much clout and they can advocate for something. How many of them advocate every year and spend money on levy fragility, their second or third interest? Anybody ever heard anybody spending 10 cents on levy fragility in the Delta? Which is why we're now in the situation we're in. So public safety must come first, but it seldom does. Second lesson then is a corollary to that. Local involvement is intrinsic to the process. There are always going to be local agencies, local interest groups, and so on involved in the process. And the engineering and the government leg of the process has to be strong enough to accommodate that, override it with necessary, and still get safe flood systems built, constructed, operated, and maintained. And that's a challenge. Then we'll come to that last big failure, 17th Street Canal Breach. I want to point out before we do that the 17th Canal Breach occurred over here and flooded pretty much this entire neighborhood. But it stopped right here because of the canal and because of Metairie Ridge, a ridge of high ground, which created a pocket. And so additional 350,000 people over here in Jefferson Parish were not flooded. They would, however, have been flooded if the west side of the canal had failed. And it was beginning to move and was perhaps only saved because the east side failed first. This was hanging by a thread. It was a very near miss. And it would have probably increased both the deaths and the damages by about a factor of 1.5 in the overall event. So we dodged the bullet at that location. We'll now look then at the 17th Street Canal Breach, which was the single most important breach during the whole event. This is the 17th Street Canal Breach. This is Pontchartrain. This end, you can see the harbor has been destroyed by massive storm waves, rendered into driftwood, and the driftwood has been piled up against the bridge because the bridge openings are pretty small. They were sized to be small so that water and waves wouldn't travel under them and cause waves down the canal, and so there was almost no wave action in this canal. The winds at that time were running straight down it, and so what wave action there was was also benign. The failures over here, and everybody can see the hole, the thing to look at more carefully is the piece of embankment over here, which is open like a hinge on a door, and from here to here has slid laterally about 52 feet as a lateral translation. And that's not how we like levees to perform. This is why. This is a close-up of the uh, repair of the section. You can see the, the military is dropping in oversized bags of gravel. This turned out not to be a very good idea. One of the things we went down to New Orleans to study was the emergency repairs because we have issues with our own levees, and we decided this is not a good thing to do. Because when they got all done putting these in and went then to drive sheet piles through them, the sheet piles hung up. They didn't hang up on the gravel or on the bags. They hung up on the Kevlar strips that are being used to lower the bags in, which catch the sheet piles like the stirrups on a horse. And so in the end, they had to drive the sheet piles out in the canal 48 feet, come along this way and come back in, dig all this out and start over again and replace it. 
So what might have been a $15 million repair, if this guy over here had continued pushing soil across, which he would have finished in almost the same time frame, instead became a much longer process as they had to repair it in the end three separate times as almost three separate projects. More important for us today, though, is the displaced embankment section here, which you can see has been cut in half by the sheet piles. That's the inboard half of the levee, and it slid sideways. It slid sideways, if you look at the crest fence here, with absolutely no rotation. That crest fence is still dead plumb vertical. It's also piled a shed into a house right here, and we're going to look at the next picture at a cross-section right across through here and see what happened to this site. It'll take a minute to form the picture because this computer is old and cranky, but I think we'll wait for it rather than flipping back and forth, so if you bear with them, I think the picture will come up. I could tell jokes while we do this, but since 1,500 people died, I'm trying to avoid doing that. This is pretty grim stuff. Oh, while we're waiting for the picture to form, it's also worth noticing, for those of you who are of an engineering bent, that at the time this photograph is taken, there's no flow back and forth, and in fact, the waters have equilibrated throughout the entire neighborhood. So this picture was taken on Friday morning, after the Thursday midday equilibration of waters. Maybe we're not forming a picture. That would be a terrible shame. The next picture is the most important picture in the whole thing. We'll just wait for it. We could have a combined moment of silence for the victims of both New Orleans and 9-11. Both events give me the same sort of sense, one of both sadness and, and also some frustration and anger. Seems like we might have done better in both situations. Anybody that would listen. <laughs> And that's important because people that wouldn't listen included the city government. Uh, Ray Nagin hasn't heard it yet. The state legislature we did a special presentation for, but the city government wasn't particularly interested in hearing it. And the principal levy board that's most functional in a lot of this stuff has also avoided hearing this presentation, although they did send spies to one that we gave for other people, so they sort of heard it. It's uh, very interesting to us to keep track of who does actually hear these things because there's... Oh, we're going to go past it again. That was tragic, yeah. Maybe we can get it to come back again. Yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to it. It's, it's still worth waiting for because it, it is the piece de resistance. Besides, Rune sitting over here helped draw this next picture, and I'm sure he wants to see it on the screen. This is Rune Storson. He's one of our students that worked on this project. Yeah, I think it's coming back. I just have to wait for it. I'd love to tell you what this is, but I want to save that because this is sort of the punchline. So for now, this is a soil sample. In a minute, it's going to be the most important soil sample ever taken in the history of the world. But right now, it's just a piece of dirt, a bit of mud. So I'll let that one float as a teaser. By the way, this is not my laptop. Mine struggles too, but it doesn't struggle quite as much. I guess while we're waiting, maybe we save some time. Are there any questions we can answer up front? Because I can go back and forth easy. You guys have any questions that are burning a hole through you right now as, as, we, as we speak? I know you wait till we start the summary part, then you can pose your questions. would have made a massive difference. We lose about a foot of surge for about every mile or two of cypress swamp, or about every three or four miles of non-cypress swamp, just from simple damping of the waves and the energy coming through. And the barrier islands would have also delayed that storm surge. Instead of being a sharp pulse, they would have taken the top off of it. We might have saved several feet of surge. If we saved several feet of surge, there would have been no overtopping anywhere in the system. It might have been enough to make all the difference in this case. All right, quick. All right, while it's there. Everybody take a mental picture. This is a cross-section through the levees that existed before, and what happened here was the whole thing was cut in half by the sheet piles. The water came from here up to nearly the top of the wall about here and pushed the whole thing sideways as a single piece. 
sliding along a red layer right along in here with multiple toe scarps coming up through there. And this layer right here is the key to the game. We're not going to go through the geotechnical analysis. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> Whatever happens next isn't so bad. We're good. That's where we want to be. This is what comes next. This is that inch of soil, the piece right here. This is the actual shear plane that caused the failure and the breach of the 17th Street Canal, the single most catastrophic piece of the New Orleans system, probably caused $100, million worth, $100 billion worth of damage and perhaps the loss of 700 to 800 lives. At this location right here, which is from within the failure plane, it's been remolded. And when you cut it open with a knife, you can see it's different from the materials on each side, although it's not been cut open here. And you also find the fibers are torn in one direction. It's very clearly the actual failure plane, and we tracked it across the feature. But you get a better sense of this stuff in the next shot, which is a picture of the same material sampled from just outside the failure area, and that's this one. What you have here is the impact sample and a blow-up view here. And if you look very carefully, what you can see is what we find is best described as peanut butter and jelly as a sandwich. The local clay is like peanut butter. It's trans translucent. You can't look into it very well. It's not like you can see into it. It's sort of semi-gloss and has a strength and consistency of peanut butter if you leave it in the fridge for a while and it gets a little bit cold. It's sort of stiff, but you can easily move it and stick your finger into it and so on. It's not very strong stuff. But it's massively stronger than the shiny, clear stuff over here. The shiny, clear stuff over here is a layer of highly sensitive, extremely soft, weak, organic, clayey silt that was laid down by a hurricane based on carbon dating of pollens that occurred about 1,250 years ago. And this layer was a ticking time bomb buried in this site waiting to cause this particular failure. It was missed by more than three dozen borings in the original site investigation, and it was missed by an additional three dozen borings and about a similar number of CPT probes in the investigation after the failure. And that's because it's very hard to spot. And the reason it's hard to spot is because of how it was laid down by the hurricane. It's only an inch to an inch and a half thick at most locations, and it's covered by about five to seven inches of organic debris that blew off the trees, twigs and leaves and similar, and came and settled on top of it. And so if you drill a borehole down and you reach this stuff here, you have to clear that out of the hole before you can sample. By the time you get it cleared out, you've removed the material you were looking for. If you poke a cone penetrometer through there and try and do electronic sensing, by the time you fight your way through sticks and the twigs and the leaves and finally get some data you can make sense of, again, you've just passed through that layer. So this is perhaps the only forgivable failure in the entire system. This was a really hard one to catch. At the same time, it wasn't something that was tough for our team to go back and analyze after the fact, and so it was daunting to us that the federal investigation didn't catch it. What we did is we did the investigation backwards. We began by doing the geoforensics and figuring out that we seemed to have a translational failure on a layer of unusual stuff, probably of good lateral extent at a depth of about 5 to 10 feet from the toe. And then we studied the Corps of Engineers' seminal works on the regional geology from the 50s and 60s and found that, like in California, these layers exist and they're very dangerous. And so we sent our people out to drill at the inboard toe at a depth of about 5 to 10 feet, looking for a layer like this, probably covered by about 7 inches of sticks and twigs and leaves. They found it in their first borehole and tracked it across the site with the next 11 borings. So in the end, it wasn't impossible. It was just very hard. The lessons here are important for those of you for engineers. The analysis, by the way, once you have the layer found, is simple and easy. It works out very nicely, and this is the failure just as being to occur with the water level at about 9 feet on the outboard side. A gap is open, the water's down in here, it's pushing the whole thing sideways, it's failing on that layer, it'll come up here, it'll come up again here, and it'll come up again here. There's a secondary failure under here, though, which is not forgivable. These are softer, deep clays, and a deep rotational failure was beginning to evolve down here. Had this layer not been present, this would not have failed during Katrina. But this would have failed before the water leached an elevation of plus 12 and a half feet, which was the nominal design elevation. So this section would have failed at design loads even without this layer. Lessons here are important. The first one is perhaps the most important. I don't know how many of you are geotechnical engineers, but the first one is that geology matters, and it matters a whole lot. How many of you are working for engineering firms? where the geologists in your firms are not heard by the engineers because they make $10,000 less per year? <laughs> How many of you are geologists and find the engineers can't hear you? Okay. Engineers, you need to hear your geologists. 
This was not something that geotechnical people were going to find by normal means. This was something that geologists had to spot based on the stratigraphy and the conditions present at the site. Secondly, communication between the field personnel who are the low end of the totem pole in terms of salaries, lab personnel who make roughly similar amounts, and the high-end engineers doing all the schmancy analysis design has to be comprehensive. The official federal investigation was segmented. These were four separate teams, and they didn't talk to each other. And nowhere in here was there a geologist. There was a fifth team doing a geology section for their investigation report. There are two outstanding geologists on the core IPED investigation team, either of whom could have easily solved this for them, but nobody asked. The third lesson is local involvement again versus local interference. These canals should never have existed, not as part of the hurricane system. Corps of Engineers had fought for more than two decades to put gates at the top of the canal, which they would close during a hurricane and not invite the enemy into their backyard, where these fragile levees and flood walls would be an easy target. They were defeated by local interest. Guess why? Because the guys on the water and sewerage board were afraid that the bastards on the levee board would close those gates when they had to pump out water from storms from rainfall. And so the locals wouldn't let the Corps install the gates, which are now being installed after the fact, and in fact, the gates are still putting in the last of the pumps right now. So again, you had massive local interference, which you could argue was the cause of the whole thing, all the failures of these canals. And finally, in the end, the last one was competent independent technical review. There were 11 sets of engineering lapses or questionable judgments, and in fact, even three flat-out mistakes, as best we can tell, made in the design of these sections. And we think a good outside technical review group would have caught all of those easily. Okay. Summary, what did we learn? Well, the three main findings are as follows. The first is the levee system failed, and I point out it failed early and often. There were 45 separate breaches. It wasn't one or two. It wasn't like it almost worked. The levee system failed in large part because of embedded deficiencies and because safety and reliability were routinely traded for economic advantage and short-term savings. These problems arose largely as a result of organizational, political, and resource allocation issues intrinsic to the overall process, a very Byzantine process involving all layers of national, state, and local government. And finally, because of these two issues up here, we cannot simply modify some of the engineering and analysis details. We can't simply change the design manuals. If we want to make levy systems that are going to work, we have to change the overall process. We've got to get a process that's driven by safety first, not politics, local interest, advantage, or cost savings. It is penny-wise and pound-foolish to save a few percent on the construction of a levy, which then fails and costs you hundreds of billions of dollars. Okay. I want to finish then quickly by transitioning to California and draw some bigger lessons which come home to roost for California. The first of those has to do with that cost-effectiveness. This is a plot of what's called risk. We have along here is the number of lives you would expect to lose if an engineered project goes badly. And down here, the number of dollars that might be expected to be the consequences. And over here is the annual probability of having it go badly based on current standards of practice and ordinary margins and factors of safety. And what you have over here is a variety of human endeavors, including foundations for regular buildings, offshore oil rigs, super tankers, and so on. Down here, I've highlighted current use practice with regard to large dams. Large dams are treated very safely because large numbers of life and large numbers of dollars are typically at risk when large dams fail. This is the number of people that died in New Orleans, and as best we can tell, the system was going to fail that way about every 30 to 60 years, the way it was built before Katrina arrived. It had been targeted for a 300-year level, but of course there were flaws and problems, and the levee crest had settled, so it was going to fail more often than that. And what you can see is this is nowhere near this. And in fact, the difference is enormous. And it would have been better if it had been moved in that direction. The arrow I put on here is not an idle arrow pointing in that general direction. It's an arrow whose tip down here is where the Dutch would have engineered New Orleans. A large city with that kind of population in Holland would have had 10,000 year protection against catastrophic flooding from storms, which means that it would have failed about 10 to the minus 4 chance every year. And there's two orders of magnitude, a factor of 100 times extra safety involved in that design. It's not just about aiming for higher levels. It's about using higher factors of safety. It's about being more comprehensive and analyzing all possible failure modes. It's about having multiple levels of independent outside review and make darn sure nothing got lost. 
or omitted or overlooked. And it's about being very diligent and very careful and then maintaining those systems and in fact improving them every year. The Dutch don't just have highly safe levies. They have levies that they improve every year. If they have a bad year in the economy, they take it out of their school system. It never comes out of levies. It's a whole different framework because the entire country stands at massive catastrophic flood risk. Okay, we wouldn't have those problems in California, of course. Um, I note with some chagrin that officially today, as we speak, the least safe major city in North America with regard to flood risk is our, city, our state's capital in Sacramento. It's nominally currently designed to have an 85-year level of protection. We're trying to raise the crest at Folsom Dam and take off a bit of the inflow peak and get that up to 100. There's also a SAFCA initiator project over the next five to seven years trying to take this up to about 200 level of protection, which would be nice. But you can see that we're not necessarily going to be the big brother among major cities in the U.S. that have these kinds of issues. If you're trying, I guess, in vain to make sense of this plot, my, my advice is rearrange the horizontal axis in your head and take the horizontal axis as distance from Washington, D.C. <laughs> okay. And of course, New Orleans didn't really have that level of protection. They were down at about the 30 to 60 year level, and now they're trying to get the system back up to 100 year level and get them recertified by FEMA before they push forward and try and achieve higher levels of protection. And we don't really think Sacramento, even with Folsom Dam, is going to be at 100 year level because there's also antiquated hydrology data. We have global warming and the hydrology situations changing anyway, and there is seismic risk, which is not yet included in there. So in fact, these are likely to actually be down more or less at these levels also. There's also East Texas, where we've been having a lot of concerned engineers sending us cross-sections and plans and design memoranda for their system, and Florida, where people are deeply concerned, and these may not be very safe regions either. And then you have to ask yourself what's special about these five. One is we haven't studied them yet. <laughs> but having said that, I want to tell you that I do think that in Kansas City and St. Louis, the levees are significantly better than they are in New Orleans and in Sacramento. And I don't know much about Dallas and Tacoma. That's something to have a look at. But the odds are that a great many of the levees in the United States are designed for 500 levels of protection. And on the left coast, it's not that way right now. So we do have our own sets of issues here. The other thing to learn, though, is that this is not a local southern Louisiana issue, nor is it a Sacramento issue. This is an issue for the entire nation. All 50 states have levees. 33 of those states have enormous miles and miles of levees that protect large populations. And we haven't for 40 years paid proper attention to infrastructure. And the very bottom end of infrastructure is levees and sewers. Of all the things that are creaking and groaning right now across the nation, it's levees and sewers. It doesn't get any less glamorous, as my wife keeps telling me, than levees and sewers. But levees and sewers share a common characteristic, and that is that when you need them, you really need them. Okay, in California, we actually have several levels of levee problems. First one that's most obvious, the city of Sacramento, a city with a population of roughly half a million, same as New Orleans, which sits at high risk from two sets of attack. One is from river floods, from massive storm runoff from the North Sierras coming down all at once in unmanageable quantities, and the other is from earthquakes. That's highly analogous to New Orleans, where they have the same river risk. And the other one is not earthquakes, it's hurricanes, which are infrequent, but potentially catastrophic, just as are earthquakes. We have Stockton at the south end. Stockton's levees are actually in better shape. Stockton's levees are designed right now for a 200 year level of protection, and they appear to be likely at about that level. So they're in somewhat better shape, but they're also seismically vulnerable. But in between, we have the Sacramento Delta. Sacramento Delta is, of course, a massively complex and fragile labyrinth of channels, the 62 islands and 1,100 miles of levees most of them local and non-federal project levies, and most of them in a very brittle and fragile condition, especially with regard to seismic loading. And there's a third risk to California, and that's everybody else besides Stockton and Sacramento and the Delta, which holds our state's water supply hostage. 68% of our fresh water, of course, runs through the Delta, and we draw from it for the Bay Area, and we send a lot of it south, 23 million California, and we get some significant fraction of their drinking water from the Delta. We have all the rest of the state. We have Yuba Marysville area up here, which had massive flooding uh, less than a decade ago. We've got Southern California. We've got all the Southern Stockton area. And the thing about that is we're filling those places in. 
Right now, the populations at risk are about 2.1 million, but that number is increasing rapidly every year. And we'll look at that also very quickly as we go by. But it's the delta that is the key piece to all this. Right now, if we lose the delta, we lose the ability to provide fundamental water supply to about 23 million Californians. And if you do the math, you cannot put 23 million Californians into even the biggest Texas football stadium. They just will not fit. Nor can we keep them there for several years, possibly three to five in some of the scenarios. So we have a significant risk here to the very heart and longevity of California and the world's fifth largest economy and the economy of the nation. There aren't as many lives at risk, but the economic consequences and risk here is enormous. So is the ecological and ecosystems risk. And of course, these levees fail. Um, Jones Track failed two years ago on a sunny day, and this is what it looked like. The levees fail from lots of reasons. Sometimes they fail from overtopping. This is very high water levels coming over the crest at Twitchell Island, and this is under seepage popping up at the toe down here. And in fact, there's four classes of general non-seismic levee failure risk. One is overtopping. One is erosion from wind and waves or erosion from the channel currents, which undercut the levees moving in that direction. The third is, of course, the inevitable under seepage and also through seepage. And by the way, through seepage gets exacerbated by burrowing rodents who are very bad predictors of weather. All year long, they build their burrows just above the water line. Every spring, when the spring runoff comes down, they're surprised the water goes up again, and their burrows become tunnels and pipes for water to come popping through the levees. And the fourth risk is we're not sure. But my suspicion is that this risk over here has a lot to do with this figure. It just evolves slowly over time and finally bites us. But that's not what keeps me awake at night. What keeps me awake at night is the one that's not on this page and has not been customarily part of levee design in California, and that's the seismic risk, because that represents the Armageddon scenario for California. To understand that one, it's best to have a look at it. And so here's a levee that failed during an earthquake from seismic soil liquefaction in 1995 in Kobe, Japan. These guys are walking along what's the crest of the remaining levee. This is the inboard face over here, and they put this kind of slope protection on there so that if they have overtopping, it can overtop safely for a few hours, maybe even a couple of days, and not erode catastrophically, and that's a good idea. That would be something that would be nice to have had at some of the levees in New Orleans. I'd like to tell you this is the outboard face of the levee, but it's not. This is the paved crest road. This is the outboard side of the levee over here. And the cross section through here Along there, we'll show you what's going on. And this is that cross-section. What's happened here is that the sand, which was filled with water, was shaken, and it liquefied, which means that it stopped being sand with water in it and started being water with sand in it. It became a fluid. And the levee simply sank into it and spread itself out in blocks and pieces, and it simply ceased to exist. And it didn't happen at one location, causing one breach. It happened for 11 miles, continuously. And we have 1,100 miles of levees in the delta. And we expect in some earthquakes to have multiple hundreds of those miles slumping and cracking. And we expect to have many dozens of breaches in some of those scenarios. And so it's going to be a big problem if and when it happens. The question then is, what's the risk? How likely is that to happen? Anticipating that question, I point out that we do have a very active fault system in the Bay Area. But the delta occurs to the east of all that. Unfortunately, not far enough to the east to be out of risk. And local faults producing small events or farther faults like Hayward producing larger events are all capable of doing this kind of damage. The next question then is how likely is it to happen? And that's being studied in great detail right now. But in the late 90s, we took a first pass at that. We broke the delta up into regions based on their fragility and seismic risk. And the conclusion was as follows. This is our best estimate and our range of projected uncertainty. This is the number of failures we expect to get and the annual recurrence interval of the events that would cause those. And the magic number is about 6 to 10. If we have more than about 6 to 10 levy failures at the same time, we can't fix them all at once. And if we can't fix them all at once, there is the risk that they will begin to take over and run away from us. The risk of having 6 to 10 is about a half a percent per year. It's about a half percent chance per year of California becoming for a while a third world country. The consequences of that are without precedent. There are projections as to what the government response might be, but nobody's very sure. No one's ever seen this in peacetime. Okay? The ramifications of this would be absolutely mind-boggling.
for a modern society like our own. As the islands flood, this is Jones Track on the back side, what happens is they become a big pond where wind can come across, that's called fetch, and it can put energy into the water and they can attack the back sides with a lot of wave energy. And the inboard sides of the levees have no erosion protection, so at Jones Track, along about 10 miles, we had to place emergency riprap and fight that. We can do that for one island. We can even do it for several. But we can't do it for many all at once. And so there are islands that have gotten away. In the delta, there are two large ponds, which are former islands which were not able to be repaired before they eroded from the inboard side, and they're just simply gone forever. Our ability to respond is a function of access, equipment, and materials. The only thing we can plug breaches with is very large stone, because the tide goes through twice a day with a big swoosh, and regular soil won't simply sit in these holes. We can only make rock so fast, and there's only one principal quarry in the Bay Area that can make large quantities of rock. It's under constant pressure to be shut down by neighbors who don't appreciate the blasting noises, even though I note parenthetically they got cheap houses because there was blasting noises when they bought them. And it's a vital resource for the state because our water supply hangs on the Dutra quarry. If we lose that quarry, we lose the ability to plug levees altogether. We can only blast rocks so fast from that quarry, we only have so many barges with cranes on them, and so we can only address so many breaches at one time. We could, of course, stockpile rock in advance and have it ready, and we could, of course, have a state fleet of barges with cranes, which would be ready, and then we could handle more all at once. We're not yet doing either of those, but it's certainly being contemplated among the mitigation alternatives. And why do we care? And the answer is why we care is because all these rivers and channels and sloughs coming through here are fresh water because they're moving. They're in confined channels. Sacramento River comes in from this side. Stock, the uh, San Joaquin from this side. The McKellamy comes down through here. And all those channels and so on are only fresh water as long as they have velocity. If you fail the levees and you create an inland lake, then salt water from the bay begins to mix in by osmosis and also by tidal flux moving back and forth. And this is a situation based on hydrodynamic studies of 37 levee failures followed by about two weeks worth of tidal flux back and forth. And what you have here is salt concentration by color. The red and orange stuff is the bay and it's salt water from the ocean. Ordinarily, the fringe where it starts to be not quite all the way blue, which is about what we can pump south or extract locally for use, is in this region. Once in a while, in late August and September, the fringe moves in more or less to this area here, and occasionally, in the old days, you used to get a little bit of salt taste in Contra Costa's water, sometimes in the early fall. Now they have a big reservoir, and they're able to mix that water, and you don't taste it anymore. But ordinarily, the colors down here are about that color, that's the fringe. What you have here is a system where we have a massive plug of salt water, and there is no way to extract water from the delta, and there's no way to take the major river inflows from here, pass them through the delta, and extract them and send them south from the pumps down here. And these 30-some breaches will not be repaired in the first year. Some of them will erode and cascade and get out of control. And the thought is this scenario represents probably a three to five year outage of California's basic plumbing system. And Southern California has a one to two year supply of water, maybe three if they ration. We don't know what that means. No one's been willing to think that all the way through. That is being studied. The studies addressing all this right now in a very urgent way are the Delta Risk Management Studies, DREAMS. The acronym was developed because many of us for several decades have been dreaming we might have a chance to do these studies properly. And these particular analyses were performed by one of the consultants on the DREAMS project, a consortium of more than a dozen firms and several dozen additional consultants working jointly for the state and federal uh, DWR and Corps of Engineers as the lead agencies. Um, DREAMS is not going to figure out how to solve this stuff. DREAMS is a technical engine working out what the risks are, and as people feed us solutions, we'll feed those back through and tell them what the consequences of those actions are. But it's not our job to make the final decision. There's a bigger framework around that called the Delta Visioning Process. I'm thrilled that they called it that because it sounded like we were going to get some really good peyote to smoke. It's not what it is at all. It's actually a political process for deciding what it all means in the back end, and that's appropriate because it needs to be a shell like that to make these kinds of decisions. And there's more going on. There's that little thing called global warming. And global warming brings two extra pieces to the game. One is sea level rise, and the other is changes in precipitation patterns. This is a projection by one group of what a three-foot rise in sea level would cause. And this is, of course, the former delta, which you can see over here. Now, an inland sea. It doesn't have to be that way. 
three, three feet of sea level rise might happen over the next 100 to 150 years or more. It'll happen slowly and progressively. And we can improve the levees and keep ahead of it if we're willing to spend the money and be diligent. And dollars and diligence are going to be a recurring theme in this kind of work. Or we might let it go that way. It depends how we choose to behave. The other issue, though, is the change in precipitation. Right now, California gets free reservoir storage with our snowpack. With global warming, we're going to get less snow and more rain, and we can't build more reservoirs. And so we're going to get a lot of water coming down all at once. And there's one more out-of-control process, and that's us, the humans. We are now infilling these areas, and so when we have floods like at Yuba Marysville, we now have a lot of people at risk. So the final slide is, what do we have to do about all this, perhaps here in California, but as a nation as well, and the answers are the same, and they're as difficult as they are self-evident. The answers are as simple. Dollars and diligence. In the end, we'll only get what we're willing to pay for, and we'll only get that if we're clever about it. We have to be organized, we have to be proactive, not reactive. The big debacle in New Orleans was not FEMA. FEMA didn't pick up the pieces very well, but they weren't going to save the city. All they were going to do was save some of the lives. The real debacle was the levee system. Multiple levels of state, federal, and local government and locally outsourced engineers and construction contributed to that massive failure. And that was the problem. We've got to fix it before it happens. We have to be diligent about it, and we have to remain committed. Finally, a note in passing, New Orleans has now been flooded six times in the last 91 years, twice rather severely, and six is enough. If we don't learn these lessons and take advantage and fix California, we are not doing our jobs. Thank you. Oh, they're innumerable. The uh, soil conditions of, of any levee system are always extremely challenging because we build levees in swamps. Massively strayed deposits, riverine systems, changes from one borehole to the next that don't track laterally, under seepage problems, soft clays. Seismically, we have organic soils that amplify the response and we have sands that liquefy. Just about every geotechnical hazard known to man tends to be persistent in levee environments. Um, in simple terms, you'd have to be an idiot to be a levee engineer. Yes, I do. Vote for both of them. We need all that money. It's still not going to cover all of it, but I want to take the comment well beyond that. There's a piece missing. State of California is bellying up to the bar and is proposing two bond initiatives for roughly $6 billion total to address its levy risk. What's missing is match matching federal funds. I'm tired of being the West Coast and the Left Coast. It's time the federal government stepped up and did its share of levy work and protection of the public. If we were Delaware, we'd have money for levies. <laughs> we probably need to turn the camera off so I can answer that one. Although, honestly, let me be a little bit delicate about that. Um, a really nice packet of legislation was withdrawn two weeks ago from the state legislature, which would have required developers trying to bring in large numbers of people to build levees to a 200-year level of protection. The Dutch have done the math properly, and they provide about a 1,250-year level of protection for small developments like that and 10,000 for major cities. 200 is a drop in the bucket, but the developers argued that taking it from 100 to 200, which is about an extra 18 inches of crest height on your levees, was absolutely an insurmountable economic hurdle and that no development would ever happen again in California. They made that same argument about a decade ago when the original 100-year standard was brought in. It went in anyway. They held their breath for about a day and a half and they went right back to developing. I don't buy it. 200 years is not a reasonable level to be asking for. I agree with them on that, but I don't think it's because it's too high. I think it's ridiculous that I can't imagine we could be prudently putting people behind levees with less than a 500 year level of protection and some seismic protection as well. Or if Greenland ice shell falls off or if the three ice yeah, shells fall off Antarctica. Then essentially this whole 
edge and saying, oh, okay, get to see it a little bit better. It'll mm-hmm. be safe. And what about the stepping back and thinking, well, we're not going to do this a little bit better. This is stupid. Um, you know, it is totally stupid uh, to the Delta. And yet we're, we're going right ahead and doing it. Well, we're actually trying to keep people mainly out of the main delta. There are a couple of islands being developed, but we're in that secondary zone now. We're beginning to intrude. Um, let me start off with the stupid part. Everybody in this room who had enough interest to come today should take a field trip sometime this fall. And the place to go is the south shore of Twitchell Island and be there at a high tide. If you stand on the crest of that levee, you will get the impression. Take your boyfriend, your girlfriend, your wife, your husband, take somebody with you, have a picnic and stand on that levee and watch the tide come up. And what you will say to yourself is, this is stupid. It just doesn't look right. It looks very unsafe. It's 26 feet down to the one side and the water's right up at the top of the other side and it just doesn't look like it's a very safe thing and it's not. So the this is stupid comment is very well taken. Um, the dream study is going to also consider by expert consensus and so on the possibility of more cataclysmic sea level rises as part of the risk, and the state will be taking that into account as they make their plans. But the, uh, the perception right now is that the preponderance of likelihood is for a progressive rise over the next 100 to 150 years, and the cataclysms will be postponed beyond there. But of course, the permafrost melting is new, and every week we have a new something else, so it may actually happen faster, and that will be built in as best we're able in the process. an easy one. No. Should there be? Yes, there should. There will, however, be a state inventory and also a national inventory of levies, and hopefully that will trigger additional action. But right now, in the absence of improved legislation with regard to levels of protection to be provided and or the conditions for certifying levies, it's not likely that much will happen in those areas very soon because there's bigger fish to fry, and we only have so many dollars. Careful, careful. You can't say it out loud. <laughs> he didn't say peripheral canal. Yes, they have. Uh, the, the, the potential for permanent per- perimeter bypass systems is definitely on the drawing board among the conceptual schemes to be considered. And that would also speak to your issue in terms of water delivery, but it would not necessarily address some of the environmental concerns. I, I prefer hubris. <laughs> <laughs> the idea that somehow we're in charge because we're clearly not. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a very difficult issue and it's very loaded. And again, there's many interest groups involved here. There are people who would like the Delta to be the way they remembered it in 1940 when they were young children. That's not going to happen again. There are people who want to farm islands for forever but their islands are no longer economic and we're spending more money protecting their islands and they're extracting from farm produce. And so there's some hard decisions to be made. One of the problems in the Delta is the people have been unwilling to make hard decisions. They've been trying to bring everybody along in the sense of consensus. We need to work together to develop an actual assessment of the risks and the alternatives, but in the end, there are gonna be likely winners and losers when hard decisions get made. And we have to hope that hard decisions will happen because that's what leadership is for. I think there's still a lot of mindset that we have controlled nature of I think we're going to learn a lot of humility in the next century. Well, the, the question is actually more complex, but more elegant, perhaps, than you thought. The, uh, the original system in, in California was very heavily based on Humphreys, but it rapidly evolved beyond there. Humphreys didn't like bypasses. We have the Yolo bypass and, and a couple more, and they're brutally effective, and they work very nicely, and we've done a lot of work with damming the upstream inflows. 
The downside is that we took Humphrey's worst idea, which is the idea that if you build the levees close together, we can scour the channels down deeper. And we've been brutally successful with that because we have so many darn reservoirs catching so much sediment coming in. And because we've been scouring so effectively, we have now cleared the channels out of pretty much all the old tailings deposits from the gold mining of the uh, 49er days right through the 60s. And now we're still scouring and underscouring the toes of our levee system. And our levee system is not very sensibly situated. Um, the other half of that is that the Corps appears right now to be embarking on a principally levees only program for refurbishing New Orleans, which is a terrible shame. The earlier question was about barrier islands. Better suggestions involve 11 sets of defenses from the outer barrier islands, the cultivation of swamps, to all kinds of things before you finally even reach the levees, and then several more systems behind there in terms of response, repair, flood fighting, and even evacuation. It's a layered system. We haven't got that approach in California either. We tend to have a levees front approach right now. The DREAMS project is intended to try and change that by giving people multiple options. In fact, I'm hoping that all the ideas that come up will be filtered through that system and people begin to get a sensible look at them. Because some of those ideas make a lot of sense, and some thinking outside the box is probably a lot cheaper. In my experience, in most engineering projects of large scale, any one solution is usually not as robust nor as cost effective as pieces of several solutions that work together nicely. A composite approach is usually better for everybody. Darn. It was unnecessary. If, if they'd taken them down at that particular site, 29 feet, it would have been enough. If they'd gone down 35 or 40, they would have been very sure. So they certainly were over length when they were done, which is very American. We tend to underinvest before things happen and go bad, and then we tend to overinvest afterwards because we feel badly about it. And you'll see that in the overall New Orleans situation. The amount of money flowing in right now for upgrading the levee system is more than the Corps of Engineers can reasonably handle in a short time frame, and they're swamped and it's not going to be cost effective. We probably do need about $6 billion worth of levy work, but we don't need that much right now. We need that much maybe over the next five to 10 years. And so it's, it's, it's very American to sort of panic and respond overly afterwards. That's part of our culture. Oh, we're, we're already in writing. You guys should access our New Orleans Levy Report on the website. If you Google it, it'll come up with it. Uh, but yeah, we, we feel we have to change all that stuff. The other half of that, though, is that it, it is physically possible to build big enough levees to simply be safe. It just isn't financially feasible, nor would it be aesthetically pleasing. We could build 50-foot levees around all of New Orleans, but the people would then be in a little bucket. They'd have massive problems pumping rain, fall out. They'd have no view, and nobody would want to live there. So we would simply achieve our goals by depopulating the city. People would move out. It would be awful. So we can kind of do anything. The, the balance point is what's reasonable, what's prudent, what's safe enough. But the other thing that needs to change is we've got to stop fighting nature and start working with her. There are a lot of things we could do to be growing land in Louisiana. The, uh, the Gulf is slowly being filled in by the Mississippi River, but we're very carefully shooting all that valuable sediment out in the middle of the deep Gulf. We need that soil onshore, and there's things we could be doing about that. We've got free soil coming down there by the millions of cubic yards a year. All kinds of things we could be doing better if we're a little bit smarter about it. So by being myopically focused on traditional old techniques, we're missing a lot of chances.
right? And, and I'm a big fan of that process, but I'm also a huge fan of making better use of what we have out there. And that's a precious resource. The sediments out there right now are in the way, and we dredge and kind of get rid of it. I like to see us using that much more creatively. It's a free resource. Yeah. I, th I think, um, well, thank you all for staying late. It was a great, fantastic presentation. So thank you again, Ray. Thank you, thank you all.